the traditional, which is the sage on the stage that is so antiquated, but still pretty much the way that things are going right now. There's other ones that uh, include role-playing, collaborative, uh, informal, where you sit in groups and talk about things. The instructor then becomes a guide on the side instead of the sage on the stage. And then finally, the progressive. Why they call it progressive, I don't know. What it basically boils down to is like distance education, uh, collaborative, or I just had a massive TIA. Correspondence education. Okay. Traditionally, is the face-to-face. -face. That's the uh, general classroom setting. And that is, again, like I said, the sage on a stage. It works really good for the auditory and visual learners. Unfortunately, those students can be very easily disengaged because they are in the classroom. And if you are not a robust speaker and in, include all kinds of different things into the classroom, you get the dry eyes guy who reads from the PowerPoint and talks very monotone throughout the whole class. And next thing you know, everybody's got the tryptophan coma where they start to doze off and start searching on their phones and iPads and all those different things. So, um, And it, for your kinesthetic learners, this is not the best way to do it. Uh, I have found that kinesthetic learners usually adapt very well because they are usually your note takers. They like to take notes, do things. That way they're still doing things with their hands so that they're engaging in the education so that works well with that. Role-playing is a more student-centered approach. We're very familiar with this as EMS professionals. This is how we learn to become a paramedic. Role-play, scenario, scenario, put them in the situation, teach them. Very good for kinesthetic learners. It works really good in those environments. There are some different uh, groups, uh, again, the educational terms. The sage on the stage is a behaviorist type of learning style. This is more of a constructivist for those of you that want to deal with the educational, big educational terms. But this one is much better for the kinesthetic learner. The students become actively involved in the process. And when they're actively involved in the process, they tend to learn a little quicker and a little more. So that is the role-playing type scenario or styles. Then again, the, the collaborative or the informal, these are also student-centered. Um, you can do things like the team activities. They are uh, good for engagement, engaging the group into different types of discussions. One of the issues that you'll have is you may have your passive students who are then swept into the current and pulled out and allow the more aggressive, talkative students to kind of take charge. So it becomes very important when you do group type exercises that the guide on the side is making sure they're paying attention and have identified early on, if you can, who your passive students are and the ones that are likely to get sucked into that you know, vortex of those aggressive students who just like to talk all the time and make sure that you're getting them in and getting them engaged. So uh, that is your collaborative uh, types of uh, education. Then, of course, distance education. <clears throat> Ironically, that's how we have got to where we are today in this particular class. We have been through a hybrid format. Distance education, by definition, is where your instructor and student are separated by distance. Sometimes time and distance, sometimes just distance. Um, we did not use any synchronous educational tools for this class. I found when dealing with educator or when educating EMS folks, it's very difficult to get that time where we can all meet at the same time. So I generally shy away from the synchronous types of education like Skype is one of the, the tools that you can use. There are other tools that are out there where you can broadcast and share, even if it was something as simple as a conference call. 
you're all separated by distance, but you're all in the, the same in at the same time. Those types are still distance education, but it is synchronous versus asynchronous. This particular class up until today has been asynchronous. The assignments are there. You go in and you do them at your leisure. When you get them finished, no big deal. Today, we're all in the same place at the same time. That's synchronous versus asynchronous. So there's a little bit of uh, history information here, but all kinds of different things have been out there. And that's just the first documented case of distance education. For years and years, even back in the Middle Ages, they did stuff sending correspondence back and forth. The, whoever the instructor was would send the stuff out. They would do whatever it was and then send it back. That was the way they did it before the Internet. And then the Internet comes around and somebody's like, Oh, hey, look at this. I can just send it via email and you get it right now. So works out great. So, well, And I'll talk more about this uh, when we talk. I'll talk more about distance education and the importance of distance education, how to teach online, how not to teach online, some of the tools that are out there. Uh, to help build classes and what it takes to make a good class and what it takes what a bad class is so if you've taken online classes before prior to this one you've got some things to compare I'm not saying this one is perfect I'm not saying it's top of the line uh, you make those decisions yourself but there are different types and we'll talk more about that a little bit later on but for right now that is one of the other types of uh, presentations Generally, with your presentation, um, when you talk about the formats, uh, there is the introduction. Okay, and that's what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, well, I will give you a scenario. I'll find out what your area of expertise, so go ahead and think about that. Because I'm going to want you to present this afternoon when you do your introduction. You're going to introduce yourself as you are teaching a class on whatever your area of expertise is. Doesn't have to be EMS. It can be anything. I really don't care. But you just need to tell us a little bit about you and the class that you're getting ready to teach, whatever that class and whatever that topic is. I've had some people that are electricians. I've had some folks that were artists that actually did drawing and different things like that. And so that's what they chose to do as their skills and their presentation. I don't care. Whatever your area of expertise. I know you said something about knitting I think you're doing. I've actually had one lady did, did well, I had one lady who did knitting as her, her skill presentation. Okay? What, what, and what I'm saying with that is at the beginning of class, when you open class, you need to validate yourself. We're in a world, EMS especially, is a world where why do I need to listen to you? Okay? Now, students, when we talk about undergrad students, when I say undergrad, I'm not talking about, you know, the typical undergrad. I'm talking about brand new EMT students. They're just now coming into class. You don't as much have to validate yourself to them. I'm a paramedic. That's good enough because that's who I want to be. I want to be a paramedic. Or I want to be an EMT. And you're two levels above that. So, woo, that's all they need. But if you're teaching your peers or other paramedics and you're going to teach a topic, you need to validate yourself. Why are you the expert in that particular area? Why do I need to listen to you? Short, don't have to go on about a whole bunch of additional stuff. Don't have to tell me your whole history, but you need to tell us a little bit about it. Why do I need to listen to you? Okay? So... My introduction for this particular class. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly. I'm a paramedic. I've been a paramedic since 1994. I have been educating since 97 when I started teaching CPR. Uh, I started. I designed my first online class in 1999, and have been one of the first level one and level two EMS instructors in the state of North Carolina. That's probably enough. Had my national registry. I got my national registry in 95, 96, right out of paramedic school. I had it for years, and I just I let it lapse 10 years ago. When I was teaching at community college full-time, it just, nobody, it did not benefit me in any way, and it was just a hassle to keep up with. 
Is that important? Not really. So, first part of the introduction, enough. I could add, and probably should have added in, that I have an associate's degree in EMS. I also have a bachelor's degree in healthcare management and currently finishing my master's degree in education, specifically instructional design for online learning. But it's, an, it's a master's degree in education. That stuff ties in because it's educational. It says who and why. Do I need to go into, oh, I was a paramedic champion in 2000, state paramedic champion in 2000. I've competed at state paramedic competition 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2010, uh, 2013, 14. I just competed last year with my son for the first time. First time ever the state paramedic competition had a father-son team. We were the alternates, which I was very, very proud of. He did a phenomenal job at the uh, competition. Um, you know, do I, it goes on. My resume goes on and on. Oh, I wrote for Pearson, um, the seventh, seventh volume edition of the paramedic books. There's seven volumes now. I wrote a, several different things in there. I, I did some uh, contributory editing. I did some editing. I also wrote some stuff. Uh, so I wrote for Pearson, the virtual EMS Academy through... Pearson, it's an online EMT class, a fully online EMT class, first one ever published through Pearson. I wrote that along with Chad Parlier. Anybody knows him from, he's a, he's a local. Uh, he and I wrote that. I taught Chad pretty much everything he knows about online education. I taught his methodology class. Um, you know, it goes on, but it's not necessary. It's just superfluous, you know, and it's like being a paramedic, you know. There's a point where there's, Confidence, and then there's arrogance. <clears throat> All right, so that's your that's the instructor introduction. All right, now you're going to get to this point where we're going to talk about the the content. What's what's the content? Why is that content important? What's important about the material? Give them. Sometimes this is a great place to give a story, um, a perfect example, and. Please notice throughout the day when I do, I, I, I like to pride myself on being good at war stories in the right context, in the right place. Don't go on and on and on. War stories are phenomenal educational tools, but you don't just stand and tell war stories. So just pay attention to that throughout uh, as we go. But to introduce the topic, um, you know, we're going to talk about the content, whatever the topic is for today. So I'm going to take you to a hunting, hunter education class that I took one time. And the instructor started the class, hi, you know, told who he was and, you know, all that stuff. Great introduction. And then he said, let me tell you a story. Two young guys get out of, out of class one day, early hunting season. Gun season had just opened up. And good friends are in high school, and that was back in the day when you could, you know, keep your shotgun in the window of your truck, and your instructor come out and look at it. And go, oh man, that's nice. You know, that's I can't believe you got that. That's a great gun. You know, that, that was the day. You know, so we got out. And we decided we was going to go hunting. Or, well, I'm sorry. We see. I've already screwed it up. He said, these two young guys get out and they go and they go hunting. And while they're hunting, one one of them's sitting on the ground, and he looks over and he sees something move kind of in the brush. And it's brown and sees, oh, there's a white tail. Boom, shoots it. And he's like, yes. And so he runs over and he finds out he just shot his best friend. Because his best friend had on a brown coat that was hollow field or whatever it is. And on the inside of his thing had been torn. So he saw the inside of his coat, which was the white. There was no blaze orange. There was nothing like that. And he just shot and killed his best friend. That was me 20 years ago. And that's why I'm here today to teach you how to keep that from happening. Is that motivation? That's a motivating story. And the way he told it was way better than I, I did, obviously, because it you know, was his. But that's how you motivate students. Why do I need to learn this stuff? What's important to you as the student when... 
I walk away from here. What do I need to take away? Why do I need to pay attention? And that's why I need to pay attention. Because I don't want to shoot a friend, family member, or somebody else in that particular case. A great opening story for EMT class. You know, my kid fell in a pool or so-and-so. I was at, at a party somewhere and the kid fell in a pool and they pull him out and here's this unconscious kid and nobody knows what to do and I couldn't, had no clue what to do and I stood there and watched him die waiting for EMS to get there ten minutes later and it was too late. I could have made a difference. That's why I'm standing here in front of you today and that's why you're sitting here today. So you can make a difference. Now pay attention to what I say. That's how you motivate students. Stories like that. Real stories that give them that motivation to go, yeah, yeah, the baby in the back seat. Is that a motivator? I think so. You know, because the whole time you're thinking, yeah, I've been in that. I've been there. I've been sitting in that car going, come on, what are you doing? Why are you driving so slow? What? Ah, gee, you know, and get so frustrated and then find out that there's some whole other story that goes along with that that we just wasn't aware of. There's more to it. Those are motivations, and that's, that's part of getting the students motivated. So the very beginning of the class, you, you only have a few, few minutes, and it's usually about five minutes to get them prepped, motivated, and start. If you're starting a big class like an EMT class, this is the very first day of the EMT class, yeah, you, I mean, that your first day generally is your introduction and icebreakers and, you know, motivators and, and those kind of things. But if you're teaching a 45-minute presentation or an hour-long presentation, you only have a few minutes. Make it good. Do that uh, elevator speech. You ever heard that? Elevator speech is, you know, what, what do you say to somebody when you first get on the elevator? You've got the time from the time you walk on the elevator to the time you ride up and walk out. You've got that much time to talk to them. You've got that much time to sell them on you or on your product or on your class. It's an elevator, it's an elevator speech. What is it? And that's part of your introduction. And then these are the, this is the, what I, you hear in every class. It's three times they need to hear the material. You're going to hear it when you start. Here are the objectives of the class. Bing, 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 bing. Then you tell them. And then when you're done, you review and tell them what you told them. So tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And tell them what you told them. And then you build in some type of assessment to assess their comprehension of what you told them. And that's the gist of it when it comes to reviewing your presentations. <clears throat> Anytime you build a class, remember you want to build a class for the multimodal learner, and I think I'm skipping ahead of myself a little bit, but you can tie in all kinds of different things. You want to tie in visuals, you want to tie in uh, auditory and, and all those different topics that, that or all those different styles that you can include into that. Keep in mind there are all the different things that are available. Chalkboards are ancient. Um, I don't think I've seen a chalkboard in forever. So whiteboards, you have smart boards now that do all kinds of really cool things. Those things you really need to spend some time with. I used to be really, really good with them, but since I don't do work with them on a regular basis, I'm uncomfortable around them. I can still kind of get my way around, but they do some really cool things. I mean, you can tap on them and draw, you can just walk up and grab and slide something over and it's really neat stuff. So if you get the opportunity to teach in those types of environments, learn the equipment and learn that technology that has been afforded to you, take advantage of it because it, it does enhance your classroom. It can detract from the classroom as well. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But all those different things are there, you know, the, uh, the overhead projectors, don't even hardly see those anymore. You remember those? the Tyrannosaurus Rex head on it and you know, project it and the instructor would write on it and draw things. They're usually somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> those are cool. Um, no matter what technology you have, be prepared to troubleshoot it. It's going to go bad. Whatever you use to plan to teach with, if you're going to teach with a presentation, whether it's 
One of the reasons I like Prezi is all I need is access to the Internet, and I can use it. But what could go wrong? Aha! Uh -huh. I may lose access to the Internet. So what, what do I need to prepare to do? I need to have something else. She says a flash drive. You said paper copies, if absolutely necessary. I could do that. I need to be able to wing it with, you need to have a backup. And this is an old, anybody ever been in a fire department rescue squad, deal with any of that uh, rescue stuff, when you talk about you're going to tie a safety and you're going to tie a safety for the safety, that's what this is. You want to back up and you want to back up your backup so that you know you're covered. And Because trust me, you may be phenomenal and I'm really good with technology, but you put me on the spot and sometimes it you just can't find it and you had you not put me on the spot, I was able to just go click, there it is. But I'm like, oh God, everything just went down. Man, I've got to do this and i got to do that and, it, and I don't know what to do and everybody's looking at me and the, you know, oh wow. So be prepared, whatever it is. Uh, flash drives, carry a flash drive with you. Keep your presentation backed up on a flash drive. Extra computers. I have two computers. Generally, any time I go somewhere to teach, I have two computers with me. Uh, that may be overkill for some people, but I'm very picky and I'm very meticulous about things that I build when I build interactivities and, and different items. And I don't trust building, and this is especially for new people working with PowerPoint. Sometimes you will spend hours trying to build an animation or something in PowerPoint. And whether it's like a video or a slideshow, and you want this one picture to come in at just the right word in the song. And you'll do that, and you'll work with that for hours to get it just right. Well, you know what happens when you take that off? and you go to another computer, that computer's processing at a different speed than the computer you're using. And everything gets goofed up. Nobody else in the audience notices it, generally, but it's just that, that one thing that you spent so much time on. So that's why I'm very meticulous about making sure that I use my computers and, and all those different things. If it's a basic PowerPoint and you're just having things kind of animate in here and there, you know, you can pretty much take that anywhere. But I generally like to use my own computer, hook up to the AV projector, and roll on with it. That's just the way I work. Um, especially when you're new. Let's go ahead and get that out. When you're new using PowerPoint, and I'm assuming everybody's new. Some of you may be experts, and that's okay. But I'm just going to assume everybody's new using PowerPoint. If you like to tie in videos and link out to do some of the really cool things that PowerPoint does, first rule of thumb, every single one of those pieces of media need to be in the same folder. Save that into the same folder and put the presentation in that same folder so that if you pull it out and take it somewhere else and put it on a thumb drive, it will be on there. Because otherwise it's just links. Okay? So what happens with your PowerPoint presentation is you take a video or you're like, oh, I've got this video on my computer and I like to link it. So Pull it up and you're like, okay, I'm going to click here and it's going to link down to this presentation, this video. So you find the video on your computer and you're like, yep, that's the one. Well, it doesn't necessarily embed it in there. You've linked out to it. So then when you take that thumb drive off of your computer and you plug it into somebody else's and you click on that same link, it's now looking for the link that's on this computer, not that computer. So your presentation won't work. So that video that you put so much effort and so much of your educational value into, you now no longer have because you don't have you didn't have that in there. So those are things you have to be cautious with and be prepared for.